Pinellas County Tourist Development Council to order, please. And Stacy, before you go away, do we have a quorum here today? I, I see Doreen over there. Okay, with yeah. Doreen, we have a quorum. So yes, whew, we can we can get started. I was a little worried there for a Take minute. A bow, Doreen. Take a bow. I saw her. I saw her. She made herself known. All right, um, so we've kind of sort of done the roll already. Do we need to do it officially, Stacy? Roll call, do we need to do that officially? Okay, then we are going to go a little out of order this morning instead of me going on and on. I um, have asked Brian, since we're all so interested in what he's been doing for the last month or so, to please uh, give us a few comments and a welcome before he gets to his report at the end. So, Brian. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, Brian Lowack, and uh, thank you all for having me join you today. Um, it's been a great month over at Visit St. Pete Clearwater. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have met all of our um, employees that we have on staff and we've done one-on-ones and we've also um, they've done a, a great job at bringing me up to speed on all the different uh, work that they perform uh, every day in the organization. In addition to meeting our internal employees, uh, I, have a, I have spent uh, a large amount of time meeting with each and every one of you individually to get up to speed with your thoughts, your priorities on the board, as well as our industry partners throughout uh, the county. So uh, in a month, uh, I, I, I think I'm on my second pair of, of dress shoes, um, and uh, it's, it's been a busy month, and I've, jo I've enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, I know that one of the things top of mind of everyone, both uh, internally on this board and externally, is uh, what's going on with staffing over at Visit St. Pete Clearwater. So I figured it'd be a, a great opportunity to get everyone while they're, they're uh, starting their coffee and they're fresh to talk about, uh, give a little staffing update. Uh, starting at the top with our, our four VP positions, um, this has been a priority since day one uh, for me since I've come on, and it will continue to be until all four of those vacancies are filled. Um, we, uh, the first step that we did was we had to look, one of the concerns that I've heard a number of times from uh, members of this board and other, other members is, um, you know, the pay needs to be looked at for those uh, executive positions. So we have worked with, um, uh, internally with HR uh, at the county as well as workforce relations um, to take a look at those pays. We, we made our case for why those needed to be increased. We got everyone in the same room. We, we um, uh, worked out our differences, and we have been able to um, get those pays uh, reclassified to a level that I think is sufficient to get folks in board uh, at those positions. Um, all three of those uh, VP positions were upped to an E30, uh, which is uh, an increase from where they were, and then the CMO positions approved uh, at the C35 level, uh, which um, is, is considerably above those. Uh, so I'm confident we've got those adjusted to a level that we can attract uh, top-notch talent uh, and retain uh, top-notch talent. Uh, step two of this was to get uh, recruiters on board um, to make sure that we are uh, marketing uh, these positions to the right people, the top recruits, uh, and, and to cast that net as broad as possible. Uh, we took a little bit of a different approach that I'm excited about. Uh, we have retained a recruiter here locally from Pinellas County down in St. Pete Winter Partners, um, and they are on board. We have our kickoff meeting. The contract is signed. We have our kickoff meeting uh, actually tomorrow, and they're going to be um, taking care of the search for the um, uh, VP of Community Engagement. And uh, the timeline, the conceptual timeline that they've provided to me um, between tomorrow and when we have someone in the door is 80 days. After looking at that timeline, I do think that um, there's an opportunity uh, to move faster, um, but I would rather uh, set the expectation at 80 days as they have, and then when we deliver sooner than that, um, uh, it'll look favorable. Uh, as far as the CMO position is concerned, we, went, uh, we are communicating with Searchwide Global 
uh, which is the preeminent firm uh, for these types of positions in the searches. Uh, we'll be meeting with them on, fr on next Monday, uh, and we're close to uh, bringing them on board uh, to begin that CMO process. The last VP um, is VP of, um, VP of, what are we calling it? VP of business development over all of our sales. Um, depending on, on what we see uh, from those other two searches, we'll determine who we use for that. Uh, if we need to use a firm, uh, if so, which one we'll use. And we wanna make sure, again, as we do this, um, depending on the um, applicants that we attract, we wanna make sure that we're in the right ballpark uh, with the package that we're offering. In addition to that, uh, we have hired a firm uh, to conduct a, uh, do a study on our pay, uh, specifically for those four P VP positions and our 12 department leads. Again, to compare us against uh, other organizations doing the same thing to make sure uh, that we are attractive and competitive um, for our leadership pay. Um, that's what we've done. That's kind of set us up for where we are uh, now. Um, and what's on the horizon. I do, uh, you'll notice I talked about three VP positions there, um, and there's actually four. Um, I left that for last uh, because I am excited to announce uh, to this board, uh, as I did to our staff yesterday at our staff meeting, uh, that the VP of Finance and Administration, um, uh, we filled that uh, and announced it yesterday with, uh, for, with an internal um, promotion of Terry Tuxhorn, uh, who's been with our organization for a number of years. Terry's joining us today, and I hope that you can join me in welcoming him. Uh, in addition to those four VP positions, uh, we, we also had some uh, vacancies uh, within the departments, um, and uh, we have hired since your last meeting in May, uh, there have been five hires uh, for staff because in addition to getting those VP positions filled, it's incredibly important to uh, provide those to individual departments uh, and their leads with support um, uh, on the work that they do and they focus on. Uh, so I have asked um, our new employees that we brought on since May to join us here and they are here. Uh, um, behind you or in front of you in the crowd, um, but I will go through the list and ask them to stand and, and be recognized. In digital and communications, we have Bailey Carlson, and she's doing our content and communication coordination. Also in digital and communications is Dee Dee Haggerty. She's doing market intelligence. And Dee Dee, we actually were able to lure her over from uh, economic development. And so um, uh, we, we were doing some back and forth there, but we're glad to have her on board. Uh, in the Film Commission, uh, started just on Monday, um, we have Quinn Chittenden. <laughs> He's gonna provide Lisa's support. He'll be our Film Commission manager. And in meetings and conferences, Christine D'Amato, She's gonna be doing meeting and conference business specialist. She's, she's also joining us. She has uh, extensive experience um, throughout the um, county government, uh, most recently with the clerk's office. And last but not least, we have in advertising and promotions, Ken Chambers, who's our warehouse and shipping specialist. So with that, we have three current vacancies remaining, excluding the VP positions, and I hope to uh, put a dent in that this afternoon uh, when I'll be making an offer to um, uh, a candidate for the Director of Public Relations and Communications. So that's our staffing update. Uh, I'm incredibly proud of, of what we've done. Um, and, you know, I, I, I have been a part of that, uh, but so has um, the team over at Visit St. Pete Clearwater. Um, so I want to thank them for their, their assistance there. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you've got related to staffing. Um, any discussion? Anybody? Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, Brian, nice, uh, nice presentation, and uh, congratulations on a, a very successful uh, first 30 days, 40 days in the, uh, in the role. Um, 
glad to hear that you've got a proactive strategy underway. Um, can you share with us the, the overall strategy for filling the CEO and president position down the road? Well, um, that is not something that I have been focused on, but I see Kevin making his way up to the front of the room, and I believe he's going to help you out there. Great. Thank you. Good morning. Kevin Knutson, Assistant County Administrator. And Good morning. Harry Burton sends his um, regrets that he couldn't make it. He wanted to be here today, but he's actually on vacation, so he sent me instead. Yes. So the answer to your question is we have engaged Searchwide Global. They are already beginning the process. Kelly Henderson is our lead, and I'm working directly with her. Barry's involved in that process, but we're taking a longer time to do this than we normally would for a couple of different reasons. The first one is, is we wanted to make sure that Brian and myself really dug into what was going on within the organization, what skills we had there, the talent that was already present, make sure that we make good decisions about the staffing that we need today to, to deliver on our services. The second one is, we finished the strategic plan, but it was never rolled out, and so we want an opportunity to finish that get that up and running, have a work plan for the new president and CEO when they walk in the door so that it's already ready to go for them. And the third reason was, is we want to give a chance to Brian to evaluate his performance in this role as well. So we'll be rolling out probably around September, uh, the search to get that moving, to try to close it before the end of the year. And if I could just weigh in on that, those comments that Kevin just made, you know, whenever you have a big vacancy like this has created in our in our county and in our region and throughout the state, I I think it's very important to use the opportunity to take a big, wide, big, broader vision of it, can we take five minutes or ten to look around and see what the best practices are throughout this industry and. Are we being the best? Are we setting ourselves up to be the very best that we can be? And so I have charged myself and my staff to help Brian do some research on that issue. And it's been a, quite an interesting process to see what some of the best practices are for an organization such as ourselves. And I look forward very much to working with Brian and county leadership to lay this out for all of you in the next 30 days. I think you'll find it intriguing and worth a very big, broad discussion. So with that said, thank you, Kevin. I don't see anyone else with their hands raised for not any more questions. Commissioner? Yes. I should have not been so presumptuous. <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, it, I, I think it's a great strategy and uh, glad that there's um, a pause to look around and just make sure we're doing, um, uh, have great practices in place and can learn from others. Um, I would offer, and I, I think I, I don't want to speak for the rest of our board members, but all of us would be willing to help and assist in any way with that recruitment process. Um, be it sourcing candidates, interviewing candidates, um, and just having uh, be part of the process, we'd be very anxious to do so. Excellent. And remember that you said that because you have to be careful what you ask for. Great comments. Anyone else? You're all, all mayor. I, I was just going to say I'm, I'm shocked and amazed at what was just accomplished in 30 to 45 days, given the situation has been going on for so long. I'm just, so kudos to you, Brian. Well, and with that said, remember how, remember these comments as we move forward. It might help your own selves rethink your own responsibilities about being here and keeping your eye on the ball, okay? Anything else? Anyone else? You're awfully shy this morning. Okay, moving on, um, I would like, I don't have any other comments to make except for the ones that I just did make at the moment. So stay tuned because I reserve the right to come back and weigh in again. Uh, approval of the minutes from last, last meeting is required. So may I have a motion? So moved. It's been moved and seconded. 
All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any corrections or additions or deletions? No? Okay, and now we have public comments, and I do have, interestingly, a couple of cards. So, uh, Jeff Gao. Good morning. Good morning. I'm here to speak under the event. Is, or do you want me to wait or speak now? Uh, it, it's up to you, whichever you prefer. Call me. If you don't mind. Okay. Remind me, though, in case I forget you. And then I see Quinette Fazell. She wants to talk under elite events as well. Do you want to speak now or later? Okay. Well, then, please take a seat, and I will remember to call both of you, hopefully. Okay. Anyone else in the audience feel inclined to say anything? No? All right. Um, Katie, Katie Bridges, please come forward with your summer update. Good morning. Um, morning. Good morning. I wanted to share with you um, just a recap of what we have going on for our summer advertising and share with you some of the creative that we're running. I had presented to you in April uh, a bit of our marketing strategy and what the plan was. So I won't dive, dive into it too much, just a, a recap. Um, again, our marketing objectives are always to build awareness and intent to visit the destination. We want to drive visitation, heads and beds, um, and increase that visitor spend um, and that length of stay in the destination and the awareness of uh, what our destination is all about from arts and culture to our beaches to our diverse culture. Um, to have people come and enjoy and, and stay and come back. Um, so we want to do that by prioritizing our markets that offer the greatest opportunity to generate visitation. So we work with the agency and build a, media, a market media model and look at eight different factors um, regarding visit markets, length of stay habits, their spend, um, how much it is to reach um, that visitor in that market, uh, several numerous factors using our data to, to determine which markets we're in. And then we use a media mix that will reach those consumers across multiple touch points. So looking at what, medi what mediums um, our consumers um, enjoy and, and participate in and use those mediums to reach, reach our, our consumers. Um, we like to look at brand partnerships and unique uh, activations and I'll show, share, share with you in a minute what that is. Um, and again, Market St. Pete Clearwater is a four season destination, so um, throughout, uh, the, throughout the year. And this is an important period for us as we try and influence uh, late uh, fall and er uh, early winter visitation. And then continue to showcase our new brand campaign, so you'll see that in some of the creative. So um, I just shared with you those, those markets. So we've divided into our developmental markets and maintenance markets, and that's um, determined based on uh, what we see in those markets and where, um, what, med what mediums we need to use to reach that visitation, those visitors. So maintenance markets are usually our in-state. They're more familiar with us, but we need to be in those markets to continue to share our message and what we have to offer and keep, keep top of mind. Um, and then our development are usually our, our out-of-state markets. There's great growth opportunity. They're less aware and familiar with the destination, so we need to reach them with different mediums um, to get them more uh, uh, familiar and aware of what we have to offer. And low, pe low repeat visitation with our uh, developmental markets. So those markets are Chicago, Atlanta, Indianapolis, Minneapolis, and Detroit are our developmental markets. So they're tier one, um, and we reach those. You'll see the difference in those is, is cable. Um, we are using a, a cable in those developmental markets. And then our maintenance markets, Orlando, Jacksonville, Tampa, St. Pete, Nashville, and Cincinnati. Um, when we look at our audience and who we're trying to reach, um, we look at several different factors. One is, is our visitor profile, who is actually coming here right now. And then we look at our um, vibrancy. So, um, you know, we created a, a study to determine our visitors and what they enjoy about um, our destination and all of centers around vibrancy. And so um, how we determine who we're going to reach is um, they, in, they uh, 
agree with these factors, uh, fun, variety, curious, excitement. And so we know those are the, the type of people uh, consumers are looking to meet. They also have an interest in beach and arts and culture, likely to travel to Florida on vacation, household income over 100,000, and they fit into that adults 25 to 65 range. So this is the kind of the parameters that we look when we determine which media we're going to buy. And then when we uh, look at our arts, uh, ways to reach arts consumers, um, it's very similar. They, they meet our, our, um, our leisure core audience, but they have a couple other different, um, different um, traits about them. Um, and we use that to determine our media for our arts campaigns. So um, just a general overview of the media consumption. So we are focusing on magazine, radio, television, out of home, social media, and internet. Um, and in different varying degrees throughout our plan. So, um, and, and this I'm not going to go through because I shared kind of our tactics last, but we're doing broadcast television. And uh, here is, um, I'm going to share with you two of the spots that we have running. Um, Let's make every day a beach day. Let's induce some serious vacation envy. Let's make it look like we've done this before. Let's reconnect. Let's get it fresh from the Gulf. Let's shine in St. Pete Clearwater. So that's one of our 30 second spots and you can see it combines speech, arts, um, diversity, culture. Um, that was shot last year. And then we have a second spot that we're running. Let's get away for a while. Let's wander off the beaten path and go out a little further. Let's get lost in the possibilities and lose track of time. Let's make a great escape even better. Let's shine in St. Pete Clearwater, Florida. And those two spots were built off of our Let's Shine brand campaign um, that we unveiled last uh, summer that we did extensive research and testing on. Um, to build these campaigns. Um, so secondly, our, is our radio. So we have some uh, a, a large radio um, promotion going on uh, in our developmental and our maintenance markets. Um, and we, we've got a couple, two spots, um, and I'm excited to share those with you next. In St. Pete Clearwater, Florida, every day is a beach day. With 35 miles of sugar white sands and emerald green gulf waters, it's no wonder why. Let's unwind under the sun on Clearwater Beach, ranked number one beach in the south by USA Today readers. And then liven up the night at the Sound, a new outdoor waterfront concert venue featuring performances this summer by Peter Frampton, the Goo Goo Dolls, and more. Let's shine. Plan your getaway at visitstpeteclearwater.com. So that was a really timely spot with our summer campaign to promote the opening of Coachman, the sound at Coachman Park and um, promote some of the acts that are gonna be here this summer on radio. Um, and I think only one played, um, but the other is-, is, is, a, is In St. Pete Clearwater, Florida, fun in the sun goes way beyond the white sand beaches. Let's rock out at a waterfront concert at the sound. Let's marvel at masterpieces of the Chihuly collection and make some flippered friends at the Clearwater Marine Aquarium. Let's pedal the 75 mile Pinellas Trail and stop at Florida's oldest microbrewery along the way. This fall, let's go for all the sun and none of the crowds. Let's shine. Plan your getaway at visitstpeteclearwater.com. So those are our two radio spots and they're rotating um, uh, this, this summer. Um, and if, uh, the second one you just heard promotes a fall message, show traveling here in the fall and experience our destination. So, and then out of home, um, so we have a digital billboard network in our developmental and our maintenance markets. And uh, here's a couple of that creative, um, let's get away for a while, let's unwind, let's marvel. And uh, so those are bright billboards um, as we're traveling along the interstate. And again, reaching those people in different uh, experiences throughout their day. Um, because as we consumers know, it's important to see that message throughout and it just can't be you know, a single message. It needs to be throughout for it to really resonate with people. 
And then here's another out of home initiative is our gas station TVs. And this is also in our developmental and air maintenance market. And this is a, a 30 second spot with audio. Um, and these are really captivating when you're standing there. There's really not much you can do um, except pump your gas and watch uh, these stations. And actually, I've got that spot here coming in a second. And then we have some digital EV charging stations. And those are in our developmental markets. Again, a captive audience um, when you're standing there, um, when you're sitting there waiting for your char car to be charged, um, you see our message. And so um, the, the creative on this is promoting our uh, initiative called From Playlist to Playtime, our Beach Day Beats. So we. Um, as a team developed a playlist of uh, songs that people can use to escape the everyday and experience St. Pete Clearwater. Um, and so we are promoting it on our website um, and sharing it on social. Um, it's a great engagement piece. Um, and we're using that as the creative for uh, the gas station TV. So here's uh, the spot I'm promoting the playlist. Scan the code to enjoy our Beach Day Beats playlist. Let's chill out. Let's enjoy some beach vibes. Let's soak up some tunes. Let's make every day a beach day. And then it goes into our uh, 15 seconds. Let's induce spot. some serious. But um, this is just a really great way to engage our audience uh, with something fun and special um, so they can go to our Spotify, download, and really get into the mood of planning their trip to St. Pete Clearwater. So just another fun way of engaging with our audience. Let's see. Oh, with some animation there. And then uh, this is be launching next month. It's our it's called Carvertize, and it's a rideshare vehicle wrap. So um, this is a company that's been around a couple of years, um, and we're uh, doing a partial wraps on uh, on uh, vehicles in Chicago and our. Uh, uh, Developmental Market, Chicago, Atlanta, Indy, Minneapolis, and Detroit. And it'll be an eight week period. It'll be a, a branded vehicle partial wrap. And then inside, um, we're encouraging the drivers to play the Beach Day Beats playlist on the radio and tell their, um, their writers about it. And then they'll also be handing them um, a handout so that they can um, go check out the playlist on their own. And also encouraging them to sign up to get our Gulf to Bay Destination magazine. Um, and then just quickly going through this, this is uh, some of the print publications that were in this summer, um, some national publications, and then also some city magazines, which um, we uh, see as indexes favorably against our persona. And then here's some of the arts and culture publications, an LGBTQ audience, and our black audience uh, with rolling out publication. So here's a couple of the ad creatives that we have. Uh, Let's toast on the Gulf Coast. Let's get away together, and this is a beach and arts combined message. Uh, let's play all day, family. Let's plan on no plans. So this is some of the new brand creative. And this is one of our arts ads. So you'll see the arts uh, creative is in a different color and a different tone. So it still aligns with our Let's Shine brand campaign to keep that consistency, but it takes on a little bit a uh, look of its own with the, the greens. Let's explore alfresco art galleries. Um, and we have a QR code at the bottom, scan to explore the Arts Coast, so they can, uh, we can send them to our arts website. And then on this one, we're actually um, promoting the Arts Navigator, uh, the Creative Pinellas tool. Um, so to customize your Arts Coast experience, scan or visit artsnavigator.com. And then um, our last uh, print media is our Gulf to Bay Destination Magazine. Um, this uh, launched the end of May, uh, 500,000 printed copies, and then we're estimating about 5,000 in digital downloads. The bulk uh, majority of this is newspaper insertions. Uh, we have 395,000 insertions planned um, in the New York Times and in, in, in some city newspapers. That will launch this Sunday, and then the following weekend, um, uh, sorry, two weekends after that, um, in, in people's newspapers inside, uh, in, in their home when they get their paper. And we also do standalone distribution at, the, at our trade shows. Our sales team takes them, our wet welcome centers, the airports. And then really big for us is our global direct mail. Um, we actually have a Facebook campaign running right now targeting um, a lookalike audience of those who have, re have requested our magazine in the past. Um, looking to see, you know find like people to uh, encourage them to sign up for our magazine and and receive that in the mail. Um, here's just a couple spreads, and I think uh, Stacy brought those for you. So um, uh, please take a look at that. These are uh, 
a couple uh, uh, creative. This one is our places to stay page, just giving somebody, some people a taste of what, what they can, can, um, can experience here for accommodations and then sending them to our website for more. Um, let's take it outside. Um, you can see on this, the right-hand column we have our uh, best of, um, which is always a really popular section in the magazine, um, and, uh, and our industry partners really get into that as well. Um, and we highlight those on the pages relevant to um, those, those sections. Here's a, a little sample of our art spread in the magazine. Um, and then I did just want to uh, touch base on the final results of our 2022 Golf Debate Magazine survey. So inside the magazine, we have a little card um, that's, you know, tell us your feedback for a chance to win a trip. And we get some great response from that. Um, so I'm just sharing a little bit of, so as we finalize the results from last year's magazine before we, you know, put up the survey for this year's magazine, um, we just got a final download. And I just want to share those final results with you. Um, the magazine had a 98% reader satisfaction rating. Um, very satisfied, 77% satis uh, very satisfied, 21% satisfied. 78% of the readers felt the magazine was very important, slash important to their planning process. 79% um, of readers are very likely likely to visit St. Pete Clearwater in the next 12 months. And accommodations, attractions, and dining were the most sought out information. And um, there was a 750 open-ended responses to, would you like to share any general feedback about the magazine? And there were some really great responses. Um, and so I just wanted to share a couple of those quotes from you, uh, quotes for you from the magazine. Um, and you can read those there. So some really great feedback. Um, and then there was also some really good constructive feedback um, that we'll take into to, uh, consideration as we plan for the next magazine. Um, a lot of people wrote in, I'd like to know more about pickleball spots. So we'll add that and, um, and take some of that into consideration. But it's really great to see that feedback and how it's being received um, because this is a, an important project of ours. And then I just want to touch really quickly, we're working on a, a like a local influencer series. So influencers, personalities that have created a social following um, about um, the content that they're sharing. Um, and um, I can follow up with you on some of the results that we've seen so far with our like a local series. This is just a little sampling of Amanda, who um, she is in the she was in the destination last month. She's uh, in a wheelchair, um, and she experienced the destination uh, limitless, um, with no limits. Um, and she produced produced really great content. And so um, she's just one of the many influencers that we've been working with um, to really showcase the destination and her voice to her followers. And then um, our arts and culture, uh, I mentioned at our meeting in the last time that we partnered uh, with Creative Panels and we created this arts and culture co-op program. It was open to all members of the arts community. Um, we, media selected based on to reach in-market visitors and visitors who have booked a trip. All ads included our partner images, messages within the Visit St. Pete Clearwater Arts template. And it was a 50-50 split with our partners. Uh, so we, uh, those are the results from our pilot program. We had 11 participants in the program that purchased 26 products, totaling um, almost 48,000 in revenue. Um, due to the, some of the commitments with the, the media vendors and maybe some spaces that uh, didn't sell, we did have to um, contribute a little bit more than the 50-50 at a 63,000. Um, so almost $110,000 in media for our arts and culture co-op campaign. Um, the most popular placement was our airport baggage claims at PIE. Um, no surprise there, it's a, it's a great uh, placement to reach visitors in market. Um, and uh, we're gonna do some um, fall calls and follow up with some of the participants to understand their feedback so we can help drive improvements as we plan uh, how to grow this program in the future or what's needed. And then last, I just wanted to share, um, uh, Coachman Park, our team was out um, in the uh, end of June, um, right before it opened, those two days before it opened, and we brought staff and family and friends out to um, do a photo shoot. So we could have assets that we could um, use to promote the destination and share with our partners. So here's just a sampling of some of the uh, creative um, that our talented team, Jimmy and Marcus, um, put together. Um, and here is a video. No sound. There's there's fun music behind this. Um, <laughs> 
But so we are running this on uh, social media and sharing um, with our uh, social fans to really get them excited um, about this new attraction that we are so excited to have. Um, we, I mentioned, uh, you know, working with an influencer. We have an influencer coming in next week. She's attending uh, the Google Dolls concert on Monday, and Jimmy, our photographer, is going to be out there uh, taking photos and, and really helping to share this wonderful new asset to our community. Um, And that's uh, my presentation this morning. Can answer any questions that you have? Uh, Commissioner Moore. Two quick questions, thank you. Uh, so thank you for the presentation. Um, on the distribution of the Gulf Today in the print materials, and you've listed all the various publications, newspapers, and so forth, do they also link that with the, their digital subscriptions? So as a subscriber for many years of the Tampa Bay Times, um, I'm now totally digital and not print. So would I see that as a link to their digital uh, subscription? I don't believe with the New York Times you would. No, it would just be in the printed. Um, those subscribers that actually do receive it uh, are biased based on those who actually would receive it in the mail. Uh, but we did work with the Tampa Bay Times this year so that um, we actually don't do any uh, in it printed pieces in those publications. It was all promoted. Um, they did a send through their email subscribers, um, through, through those that receive it, and there was an email that went through. So, um, so the Tampa Bay Times, yes, but with the New York Times, no, it was, our buy was based on those that receive a hard copy. It just seems to me that people who no longer get print but do subscribe for digital would still link through. And it, it's kind of a simplistic example, but for example, the Parade Magazine. If you get the, the digital subscription to the paper, you also can you know get the Parade as it's published as a, a you know, digital value, and I just don't know how much that could be pursued or if, the, if overall from a marketing, I'm not an expert, so is there a value to that? We'll definitely look into it, yes. Thank you. And then um, in the Creative Pinellas Arts uh, co-op, so to speak, you had 11 participants. Do you know if those were spread throughout the county or were they you know, they had the option and you promoted that they could participate. So was that something that was responded to countywide? Do you know? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, we had um, uh, uh, Turpin Springs participated. Um, we had several St. Pete Museum participate. The Sound participated. Um, the team at Ruth Eckerd. Um, yes, it was, it was a good, good, good mix. But yeah. and. I think when we went into it, we were kind of thinking, you have 10, you know, first time for a pilot program. So, you know, we're pleased with that response, um, but we'd love to see more participate. Thank you very much. Great job. Thank you. And I will just note that um, kudos to Katie uh, for putting this presentation. I know she went through it a little quickly. Um, that's because um, uh, when I saw how many slides it was, I almost had a heart attack. So she did uh, a lot in a little bit uh, of time. And I, I spent the day on Friday with uh, Katie, our digital team, as well as um, our, our team with BVK. And they brought me up to speed on some of the things that go, so the process that they undergo to consider um, their marketing strategy. And they're getting the ball rolling on our upcoming market strategy. So um, there's a lot. Uh, that goes on behind the scenes that Katie didn't touch on, but uh, we're proud of her and um, just want to say thank you. Yes. Uh, Commissioner, well, yeah, excuse me, Commissioner Williams. Thank you. Katie, great job. Um, as you. always, it's, it's wonderful. Um, like to see the, uh, the wraps on the vehicles. Um, was recently in New York City and saw on sides of buses uh, advertising for Washington, D.C. And when you think about the, the expanse, it's like a moving billboard side of these buses. Um, in the future, we might consider that as well in some of those key, or key feeder cities. 
Yes, we have done bus advertising years ago when we were in New York City, and you're right, it, it is an impact. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Commissioner, if I could, just one follow-up question. Um, sure. Brian, I know many of us were at the, uh, the ribbon cutting for Coachman Park. Maybe later on, you might give us an overview and so we can all speak intelligently about it. It's a great, great venue. Thanks. So I would just like to share, Katie, since I learned so much about what you did from your partner, Leroy, that recently when I was in London with Global Tampa Bay, there were 16 little tiny smart cars that were wrapped with Visit St. Pete Clearwater. And we did a parade right down through the heart of London. And it stopped traffic and people that were walking on both sides of the, of the street. It was incredible how much that struck everyone to see these little tiny cars that look like toys. And the most interesting part of it, everybody, every one of us that were on the, in the delegation, there were 16 of us, we were all riding in those little tiny cars. So it was a lot of fun and really a joy to see that everyone was paying so much attention to it. So it is quite the thing. So thank you. Yes. Yes, and obviously I was part of that. And being in the Mini Cooper with the advertising on a drizzly, overcast, cooler day was just perfect timing. Worked well. Yes, Mayor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, on the uh, arts co-op too, um, I went online and I didn't see anything about it. I, and I looked in the co-op area. I know you're already through it. Um, you know, we have several arts organizations in our city and I'm just curious, how do they, you know, find out what the next thing you're doing is? Sure, well, we um, shared it through our industry partner update, so um, we want to make sure that they are signed up to get our releases, um, and we can, you know, add them to our, our database. Um, and then we also worked with Creative Pinellas, and they shared it out um, with their audience. Um, so we we'll make sure that they're on that that distribution list as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank Good you, morning. Madam Chair. Um, interesting that Mike brought up New York. That used to be one of our key markets, and we just did something recently up there, um, but it's not in your maintenance or development. Is there a reason why we're not in New York? Well, um, this year we uh, are still kind of focusing on our, our, we're on our Midwest markets, which was the pivot that we took during COVID um, when we saw that um, New York was really struggling. And so we really pivoted to, to the Midwest markets and we continued that this year. Um, but it is something that we discussed on Friday um, at our, with the team as we put together some strategy um, about how we could go back into New York um, and what we're seeing with the data. And so that is a discussion that we are having um, because there is some promise there. Anyone else? Uh, Mr. Yeah, Kimball. Katie, um, seeing that this is the summertime, September 30th is the end of the year, uh, give us a little update on the next ad campaign and the length of time that this is going to be running and what the future, the next year is uh, going to be. Are you already working on it? Uh, and how long that lasts and all. Sure, well, uh, this campaign will, will, yes, we'll go through the end of September. That's how we can have it, have it budgeted. Um, and we are meeting with the agency right now. We met last week, uh, kind of our pre-planning to talk, discuss strategy. Um, that was following our agent, big agency meeting that we had in May to really talk about kind of those markets and what we're seeing with the data um, and how, um, you know, some other commitments that we're looking at. Um, and then we have this period is really our, our planning. Um, we had talked about maybe coming back in August and presenting a little bit of that strategy to you guys. And then in September, um, present some of those tactics, more of those uh, key things that we're doing. Um, so, so yes, we have, we've got a lot of fun ideas we're thinking about and, and ways that we can reach, um, reach our audience, but um, it's all, all in motion, yes. And one thing I also wanted to add is uh, we do an advertising effectiveness study, and I think I've shared that with you. Um, I think our team shared that with you maybe uh, last uh, September about our, our winter campaign. So, so a couple things. One, we have an advertising effectiveness study going on right now, um, fielding, for our campaign that just uh, for our winter campaign. 
And then we have plans to launch another advertising effectiveness study for this campaign that we have running right now. And we'll share those results. So, um, so yes, we have a lot of uh, research and data we're going on, and we're in the process of planning. So, so Katie, as someone who used to place the kind of ads that we do, I'm a little concerned about whether or not you're looking at the cable, the buys, the t television buys for the late fall and winter, because aren't those usually done really far out? Yes, and that's something we, yeah, we talked about last week. Um, it's, it, yes, usually it's about 45 to 60 days uh, for a lot of um, placing that by. So yes, it is important that some of those um, early deadlines the team is already looking at, um, and so we can get commitments on those, especially some like the national print publications. Um, another thing is that we've looked at is Visit Florida. A lot of the Visit Florida co-op programs, they the Visit Florida's uh, their their fiscal starts July first, and so they've already unveiled some of those co-op programs. So we've already had to take a look at some of those prop those opportunities for next year so that we can make sure that you know we get in some of those really important publications. So we are taking a look at that. So yes, some of the programs that we have next year we've already started looking at and, and putting in place so we can make sure that we get what. Uh, I'm so tickled to hear that you've got your eye on the ball. Thank you very much. Um, our illustrious leader over here has something he would like to share with Mr. Kimball. Mr. Kimball, I just wanted to, uh, uh, it was a good time. Uh, the question that you had for Katie, um, we discussed that last Friday. And one of the things that we want to make sure we do is include um, uh, you all and this board in that process uh, as we uh, uh, formalize that marketing strategy. Um, so as they put that together, they're in the initial steps now. Um, we plan, we're, we're shooting for next month to come back to you with kind of our initial thoughts, the direction that we're going, and we want uh, your input on that too um, before we finalize that plan moving forward. We want to make sure you're included in the process so you don't just get an update on what we did. Uh, Brian, um, as I sit here and watch it, um, I would say uh, we need to be also looking at, as was just brought up about New York, markets that were key markets in the past that we have not used in the last few years, and that consideration, what are those, and what money should we be spending in that area today? And then also, um, I'm not sure where it goes, but the European and the uh, Canadian market, I think we need, and in South America, I think we need an update on what we're doing to market that for 24. Very good points, thank you. Anyone else? Over here. Mr. Henderson, you're awfully quiet this morning. It's not like you. I've been accused of talking too much, so I thought I'd take a break today. <laughs> okay, just making sure. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Okay, well, it's nice to see nobody sleeping at the switch over here this last month. Next is... Um, IPW San Antonio, Rosemary. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Rosemary Payne. I'm the Director of Leisure Travel, and I am joined this morning by... Andrea Gable, the Latin America Senior Sales Manager. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And we are here to present an overview of IPW 2023, which was held in San Antonio, Texas, May 20th through the 25th. We wanted to start by showing you some images of the very impressive aisle Visit St. Pete Clearwater and partners shared during the three-day appointment show. As you can see, our area was completely themed with our Let's Shine brand messaging and newest destination images across the 120 square foot section. Taking appointments for Visit St. Pete Clearwater were Jane Brooke from our UK, Ireland, and Scandinavia office, Axel Kaus from our Central European office, Andrea and Jose Ramirez from our Latin America department, and myself. We even had Liz McCann on hand to act as a booth concierge to welcome our clients and direct them to their appointments. Also attending was Visit St. Pete Clearwater's president and CEO and Commissioner Long. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, for taking the time to be with us at IPW so that you could sit in on some key meetings and understand fully the importance of this show for Visit St. Pete Clearwater. Visit St. Pete Clearwater also had five partners join us in our aisle, and they each had their own individual workspace and appointments. The decor was bright and welcoming and is always a favorite on the show floor. Clients are always complimenting us for making IPW feel like they are at the beach. And speaking of the beach, this year we even brought in some water and a sandy shore for our photo op lounge. Here customers could snap a picture perfect St. Pete Clearwater Beach Day right in the heart of Texas. In our presentation today, you'll see several images of the photo op lounge in action. It was a very busy and eye-catching setup for customers and colleagues to visit throughout the show. And I didn't have it in my notes, but I would really like to thank Katie and um, Carmen from BBK. They were so instrumental in making our booth what it was. So thank you, as always, for your efforts in making us really shine at IPW this year. So getting down to some details from the show, IPW is U.S. Travel's largest tour operator show in the USA. There are over 6,000 attendees, and Visit St. Pete Clearwater had 179 scheduled meetings with domestic and international buyers and media from across all key markets. VSPC also had an exclusive meeting with Brand USA to discuss current and future marketing initiatives, and our PR rep met with additional media in the media marketplace. Visit St. Pete Clearwater also hosted a client reception in the booth at the close of the show. Nan Marchand Beauvoir from U.S. Travel Association even stopped by to meet with Commissioner Long to give an overview of IPW. Buyers that attend IPW bring in thousands of room nights annually to Pinellas County, and this show provides a platform to discuss increased business opportunities to grow market share from these key clients. Five hotel partners I mentioned joined us in our aisle. They were Sheraton Sand Key, Tradewinds Island Resorts, Belmar Beach Resort, Marriott Suites Sand Key, and the Holiday Inn Harborside. Of course, we have tons of notes from our meetings, but here are a few key takeaways from our international markets. From Canada, demand for Florida is still strong, and we are very, very excited about WestJet's purchase of Sunwing and Sunwing Vacations. In our meetings with WestJet, they said there are some exciting new plans in the works, nothing finalized yet, but they're refocusing on Florida. In the UK, Ireland, and Scandinavia, we're seeing strong visitation to St. Pete Clearwater from airline holiday operators, such as British Airways holidays and Virgin Atlantic holidays, amongst others. Pricing seems to have stayed steady compared with other popular UK holiday destinations that have seen sharp price increases. British Airways, their leisure and premium um, seats are showing particularly strong performance. However, corporate business hasn't really returned post-pandemic. Virgin Atlantic, the new Tampa route, has far exceeded all expectations with double-digit growth against expected figures. Premium and upper class has performed extremely well, and June saw a record for visitation to the U.S. in general, so the market is looking very strong. Out of Germany and Central Europe, the U.S. experienced a strong season from German-speaking countries so far this year, and some operators reported that they even surpassed their revenue numbers from 2019. At the same time, high inflation, very high airfares to the United States, and high energy prices due to the ongoing Ukraine conflict present challenges. Because of these headwinds in Germany and Central Europe, which may these headwinds might cause a difficult second half of 2023. So our team will be focusing on market segments that have shown a higher resilience. The Swiss market, the LGBTQ plus travelers, and high income households. Visit St. Pete Clearwater and industry partner appointments at IPW are critical to review trends, pricing, international travel sentiment, and marketing opportunities. Meetings at, up at IPW led to two FAMs last month. We had a UK product manager's FAM and FTI Germany. 
At IPW, we also met with Air Canada Vacations about their product launch in September across Canada. Apple Leisure Group's Ascend Conference in October, that Southwest Airlines Vacations. Delta Vacations University in Minneapolis, also in September, and ongoing hotel beds partner marketing. IPW provides Visit St. Pete Clearwater with three days of meetings with key customers across the globe, all in one location. These meetings provide us with an incredible opportunity to deepen our partnerships with these key customers and develop new programs in emerging markets. Visit St. Pete Clearwater also attended the Chairman's Circle Honors event at IPW. This prestigious evening is held to honor tour operators from all markets for their exceptional commitment to bringing visitors to the United States. Visit St. Pete Clearwater votes every year to make sure our top clients are included. And Visit St. Pete Clearwater and Partners will be attending IPW 2024. It will be May 3 through 7 in Los Angeles, California. And now I'll turn things over to Andrea for her update on the meetings with the LATAM markets. Good morning again, everyone. I am responsible for the Latin America Department, and I would like to share this morning with you some highlights and insights of our meetings at IPW San Antonio this year. The Latin Department, Jose Ramirez and I, we conducted and completed 73 appointments with two operators, key uh, the U.S. product managers, decision makers, also some receptive operators, and some trade media, few trade media appointments as well. I'm providing you in this slide a breakdown of by markets of our appointments and some of the insights that we learn from our clients in our cru four crucial markets, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, and Argentina, that it's avoiding the Latin America international travelers to be fully back to the United States and Florida. It's the high exchange rate, the inflations on those markets, the um, not availability of the air flight seats, especially in Colombia and Argentina, that I will speak with you and share a little bit more of what's that affecting in familiarization groups. And, and but the most important one that we heard over and over again was the US, uh, United States visa request and the delay. Right now in our far markets, the delay continues, but very strong in Colombia and Argentina. The first time US visa requests can take up to over two and a half years, and then renew of the visa about over a year and a half. It's getting better in some of the markets, like Brazil right now, the first time US visa requests is down to a year and a half wait, and some of the renew less than just a few months. So those are some of the insights that we heard overall with our clients when meeting in IPW trade show. Now I would like to share with you some of the highlights of meeting with our Latin American clients. Jose Ramirez and myself were able to, uh, to book 37 virtual destination presentations in our crucial Latin markets. I just conducted on Friday one of those 37 uh, meetings, virtual meetings, with the tour operator FRT from Brazil, and we had a great attendance of 79 a trade um, tour operator and travel devices attendance. We were also able to negotiate fiscal year 24 trade and media co-op campaigns directly with the two operators. Some uh, fiscal year 24 media campaigns were for trade media. I was able to introduce Commissioner Long and the President CEO to our crucial Latin clients, and also took the opportunity to introduce and announce our 2023 VSPC Brazil Seals mission on the week of August 21st. Thank you, Commissioner Long, for your interaction with our main clients. We also took the opportunity with those few trade media appointments to look into uh, providing four destination interviews. I was able to provide two interviews and Jose too as well. I took care of the Colombia and the Brazilian market and Jose took care of Mexico and Argentina. I wanted to share with you the image on the left side. It's the image that Panjotas, the largest Brazilian trade media, took and posted with my interview on the Panjotas digital website. The picture on your right side, it's actually to showcase to you the amazing attendance the Latin American clients was presented in our VSPC IPW client event on the last and final day of the show. We invited our crucial clients 
trade media, lots of digital influencer, and we encourage them to take photos and post on social media channels. This is my first, for last and final slide, but it's a great opportunity that Rosero Mears was able to negotiate and complete during the IPW trade show. We welcome two medias, two digital medias, to interview the five hotel partners that were with us at the IPW trade show. Each hotel partner had a few minutes to showcase the hotel properties. The media provided the English translation, and those medias that interviewed the clients, the hotel partners, were report uh, from Mexico. They are a multi-digital platform that are focused on the travel international experiences, and ABC Mundial. It's an Argentina multi-channel digital platform with over 1.1 million of YouTube views and 454,000 of subscribers. Um, I thank you for this opportunity, and I would like to open if you have any questions for myself or for Rose. Anyone? Yes. Not a question. I would just like to compliment both of you. Um, great show. It's one of the most successful that we've had for the Billmore. Um, already executed uh, contracts with five new partners, and more are expected. So it was a great job and really good turnout. I appreciate your support of Judy. Yes, you Thank too. you. Thank you. Good to have her on the stand. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, ladies, well done. Uh, great presentation. I just wanted to echo a comment that Russ made about um, uh, uh, European markets. I understand you've got some headwinds that you're facing today. Um, those headwinds will go away eventually, and I think there will be pent-up demand from Western Europe to come to Florida. So I would not give up our sales efforts there. Um, we can't diminish what we're doing because I think we could be a great beneficiary of the Western markets uh, in Europe. Um, with the airlift that we have right now and we're enjoying, um, keep at it. Uh, that'll pay dividends down the road for us. And Axel and his team are always looking for new opportunities in um, Central Europe um, beyond the German-speaking market. So he and his team are fabulous to work with, and they, they have their foot on the gas. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, just to follow up, um, seeing that we've gone the last two years, um, trying to forecast where we're going to be in everything. Maybe we should have a separate presentation uh, in the future, near future, on Canada and Europe, uh, both markets in Europe, to try and see where we are and where there's other things we could do specifically um, on it. I think that's that important. I think we're up around a million visitors, and uh, I'm not sure where we are right now, but I know it's nowhere near. Uh, so I think we need to be looking at that. Uh, separately uh, in the near future. I would welcome an opportunity to, to dive a little deeper into those markets as well. Great. Anyone else? No? Thank you so much, ladies. Thank good, you. Good presentation. Thank you. Bye. Next, we have our elite uh, event scoring and Craig Campbell. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the introduction. Thank you, Brian, for the opportunity. Uh, Craig Campbell, Director of Community and Brand Engagement, excited to be here this morning and present staff's recommendations for elite event funding for fiscal year 24. Let's dive right in here. Um, so just a qu uh, quick overview on applications a strong number of applications this year, 47 in total, with a total funding request of $2.59 million. Um, out of those 47 applications, eight were declared ineligible or withdrew after the application, so 39 applications were actually reviewed and scored. And then out of those 39 applications that were reviewed, 33 are recommended for funding by VSPC staff with a total funding recommendation of $1.82 million. I did want to highlight here um, kind of the trajectory of the program and show you kind of the growth, not only of the number of events, but the num just the sheer volume of interest in the program. So to go from 20 events, uh, 20 applications two years ago to 47, I mean, 
massive increase there, a total funding increase from $1 million two years ago to close to $2 million. Um, again, just a tremendous growth there. Um, as far as materials go, uh, each of you should have a packet, contains three documents, uh, the first of which is a memo from Michael Zoss, really does a great job of kind of setting the stage here for the conversation and discussion today. Thank you, Michael, for putting that together. Uh, application scoring, so this is really the summary of all the scores in one document. <clears throat> Excuse me. So apples to apples, how did each event score compared to the other? And then lastly, event profiles. This is gonna be the bulk of your packet, a good 60 page document or so. And it's a, <clears throat> excuse me, an event by event breakdown of all the different resources um, and everything that went into a score for an event. So it tells the story from uh, application all the way to scoring and ultimately our recommendation. So that's the packet of information you have available. Uh, we'll dive into those materials here shortly, but first I did want to touch on a couple things real quick. Firstly, the committee. Who was looking at these applications and scoring um, these events? So from a VSPC staff standpoint, Terry Tuxorn, um, Finance Administration, Katie Bridges from a marketing advertising standpoint, Eddie Kirch, digital and data, and then myself from a sponsorship and activation standpoint. Uh, a key, two key pieces of the puzzle here were bringing in our consultants. So BBK, our agency of record, really leaned on them to provide us with those media valuations and destination analysts. Uh, they've been out surveying at these events for four or five years. We have a wealth of data, so we certainly want to take advantage of all that information um, that's available to us. So priority-wise, what were we kind of looking for here? So firstly, uh, applications reviewed on their face. So we did not accept any changes after that organizer submitted their application. We reinforced this point in a public information webinar in early March. It was a real point of emphasis where you have one chance to submit your application, put your best foot forward, and we'll, we'll see how the results turn out. Uh, but we did not accept any changes after March 31st. And then that would help ensure a uniform and consistent review process. So uh, truly, those two things would help keep a fair and even playing, uh, playing field for all the applicants. Now, what were we looking for from a criteria standpoint and how did we score these events? So uh, for those of you who have participated in the TDC review committee in the past, this will look familiar. Instead of a thousand point system, we chopped off a zero and it's a hundred point system. But still the, the percentage is still the same, 70% or higher, and that will result in a funding recommendation. Um, the breakdown of the hundred points. So. Uh, 50 points we allocated for event history. So that's when we're looking at all those DA reports, all the history, uh, the methodology that um, would help kind of verify and validate the projections that these organizers are, are giving us. Um, so that's 50 points. 40 points we allocated to marketing and sponsorship. So that's where BBK's valuations came into play. Um, Kind of the two key metrics we looked at were cost per attendee and an ROI index. So um, really how expensive is this event to sponsor and then what sort of return on investment would this event generate? So in the packets, you'll see sort of some, some boxes there that highlight those scores. Um, the ROI index, just so you know, um, a score of a 100 there or an index of 100 there is a one-to-one -one return on investment. So anything below 100 is a negative investment and anything above 100 would be a positive ROI. And then lastly, the final 10 points, other considerations um, we took into uh, consideration here, whether the event was peak season or non-peak season, did this event conflict with other events within the community on that weekend? 
and then what sort of charitable contributions uh, the event organizer provided as well. So coming back to the recommendations here, um, 47 applications, eight declared ineligible or withdrawn. So we reviewed 39 uh, applications that were eligible for consideration. And again, 33 applications recommended for funding, the total funding amount $1.82 million. Reminder, the budget is $2 million. I do not um, anticipate going through each application with you, but there are a handful that I wanna flag and discuss. So, uh, numbers, so if we could actually look through the application scoring documents, the three-pager, and numbers nine and 15, you'll see are highlighted in red. We'll come back to those in just a moment. I want to keep going down to the bottom of page two of that document, numbers 30 through 33. So number 30, St. Pierre Live, funding request of $75,000. That is a new event, so per the guidelines, that funding is capped at $15,000. So that's our recommendation there. Uh, number 31 and 32, St. Pete Pride and Bay Star Clearwater Offshore Nationals. Both events requested funding at 150,000. That's a category one request, which requires a broadcast component. Uh, neither application provided details on what that broadcast component would look like. So that's why our recommendation is $75,000, which is category two. And then number 33. Mr. Campbell, can I stop you right there for just one moment? So I was looking at the data uh, under, for example, number 32. And I understand your comment about requesting, or specifically that you're requiring broadcast on national television or other broadcast services. But hasn't this event been funded for many years? This is based on Clearwater Offshore Nationals? Yeah. yeah. It has been in the program, yeah. Okay, so my question is, they asked for 150,000, correct? Correct. Now, you reduce that by half, but yet your expectation is that in order to move up to a category one uh, or a category two, which it says here, they have that opportunity, but how do they get that opportunity if you don't give them what they asked for so they can afford to do the broadcasting cable and streaming? It's a good question. Um, Michael, I don't know if you have any insight or... Sorry, I believe that's what these events have been funded at. Um, what staff was trying to recognize was, at this point, recommend the Category 2 funding with the opportunity, because it's so early for some of these events to be able to um, specify exactly what kind of broadcast services they've got in line, to have staff, they can submit those to staff, staff can take that to the BCC at some point and determine whether or not that bumps them up to a category one. Because the whole point of category one events was initially it was national broadcast as streaming platforms have grown um, we've expanded the guidelines to recognize that some of these things are not necessarily shown on television, but do have a wide international audience and national audience otherwise. So that was the whole point of this, is to now, they're not precluded from possibly being a category one, it's just right now there's not enough data. So for purposes of now, it's a recommendation of a two, which they certainly meet, and I believe is in, in um, what they've received in the past, and then with the opportunities at some point, it'll be incumbent upon them to submit that and then have the TD, I mean, excuse me, the BCC review that. So just to clarify, what I think I'm hearing you say is if between now and then they come back with their plan for how they're going to do television broadcasting and streaming, then we will uh, revisit and recommend giving them what they asked for so they can accomplish what we want them to accomplish, right? Correct. Okay, thank you so much.
Madam Chair, if Mayor. I may chime in. Uh, as many as you know, I was involved in this event in the past. I am no longer officially involved. When my wife, unfortunately, was dying of brain cancer in 17 and 18, I was a full-time caregiver, and I stopped everything. So I'm not involved, but it is an important event to the city of Clearwater. Now, Mr. Chavez has brought to my attention that he does have MAV TV, which is a motorsports and a water sports TV, which is on Hulu, Spectrum, Frontier, Direct TV, Vidgo, YouTube, YouTube TV, Fubo, Fio, Suddenlink, Uverse, Extreme, and Altice. So basically, they have national coverage now. So he, because he didn't have that initially, is he allowed now to bring that forward to get additional funding? Yeah, if, and if you look in um, Michael Zoss's memo, it, it basically explicitly says that, yes, we will consider that. Once we get the information, we'll look at it and... We can bring that forward to you. Okay. Correct. All right, I just uh, want to clarify that, because it's an important event for the city of Clearwater now that I'm mayor. I'm no longer involved directly with the event. I know. I mayor, used to go to it with you. Yes. <laughs> and anyway, my grandson. So, anyway, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Henderson and then uh, Commissioner Kimball. Mr. Mayor... <clears throat> Are all those the list is that where they're being advertised, or that's where you're going to be the events going to be televised? No, it's going to be a televised event on right. MAF TV with, with, with that coverage. Event. Perfect, great. And I, I know because the the gentleman that contacted Mr. Chavez used to work for the city of Clearwater, Sean Stafford, and he looped me in after he talked to Mr. Chavez. Sean used to be our our video guy that did, did meetings like this, and he now works for Lucas Sports, which owns MAF TV. So he, he contacted me recently and said that we're going to do that for Mr. Chavez and for the event. So, Mr. Kimball. So, uh, Michael, uh, on this one here, can we approve it at this meeting with the other ones for $150,000 as long as, and without having to go to the Board of County Commission? We recommended it. Now change to $150,000 if this condition is met uh, before it's presented. Wait, wait, hold on a minute. Excuse me. Based on the data submitted, you don't have the support for that, but you could recommend that. We could recommend it, as long as that condition is met. So when it goes to the Board of County Commission, the TDC has recommended the $150,000. I think we're saying the same thing, yes. Okay, thank ultimately. you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. All right, well, since we're on this item, does anyone want to make a motion to that effect? I'll hold on. Uh, Brian would like to make a comment. One of the things to uh, Mr. Kimball's point is that what we're asking you to approve today, uh, to recommend today, is an up to funding amount. And so um, th these events are what, what, what you're recommending, up to funding amount, authorizing that. And then after the event, before the event, when, when they occur, they come back to us and we do a deal. Uh, Terry takes care of that. And that's where those details can be hammered out. And so it can be the under, you can approve the up to, recommend the up to 150,000, and then in the, um, you can come back. And if that is not provided, um, that funding would not be given to them. Well, perfect, let's do that. Is that your motion, Mr. Kimball? That is my motion, Chair. Do we have a second? Second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Oh, okay. Madam Chair, if I may, is that motion just for Offshore National? because there was another similar event that had the same situation. Which one was that? Same people. Pride. Oh. That was just for this one here. So then you want the opposite for St. Pete Pride? Is that the recommendation, staff's recommendation? It's the same scenario for St. Pete Pride. We just don't have the broadcast details similar to Offshore. For St. Pete Pride? Correct. There were tons of uh, television coverage on that parade that's what you're talking about correct the broadcast criteria requires it to be sort of a live televised event and the event just happened this past month as you know um, they don't have quite the details ready for next year's event so that's what we're we're suggesting is once we get those details later in the fall next winter then we can make that decision well, but it's a similar many, scenario to Clearwater Offshore National given how many people were there, it's pretty hard to believe that they won't have that data and then some. Did you have a comment, Commissioner Moore? I was just going to recommend that the motion potentially be amended if everyone agrees that we look at these events, the two events in the same uh, motion. 
and with the same well, terms. Is the maker of to. the motion willing to amend? To I was going to say it myself, yes. And the, the second of the motion, Mr. Williams, are you willing to amend to include? Aye. Okay, then. Everybody that is in favor of that, please say aye. 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 Okay, done. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Is there Copy anything that. else? Yeah, we still have a few events still to cover off here. Um, not much longer, though. So number 33, Clearwater Beach Day and ReliQuest Reli Bowl. The funding request of $150,000. Again, it's a, it requires a broadcast component. We are funding the Beach Day event for ReliQuest Bowl. The game itself is televised in Tampa. However, the Beach Day event is not televised in Clearwater. So our recommendation is to fund it at a category two level, $75,000. As far as the hold events. On, hold on, Mr. Yes. Mayor. So, so my question is how, how long of a video do they play of the beach day during the actual live telecast? Sorry, excuse me? How long is the video of the beach day that they play during the telecast? Is it a 30 second spot? Is it a 60 second? Is it a, just a snippet? Typically it's like B-roll played in, yeah, bumper spots played in and out of the broadcast. But that according to um, like kind of internal staff and our agency does not meet the qualifications as a meeting broadcast criteria. Has this been funded at the 150,000 in the past? I believe it has, hasn't it? Um, it does have the funding history in the profile here. So let me look it up. We've funded it at $75,000 four out of the last five years. And in fiscal year 21, we funded it at $60,000 and that was basically a COVID-19 year. Okay, thank you. Uh, a comment, I believe also, we pay for the beach day separately from that 75,000, right? Negative. It's included in that 75,000? Correct. That we pay the event. Exactly. Thank you, Mr. Kimball. Mr. Henderson, did you have a comment? Well, just a historical perspective, we did away with the elite events for a number of years, but we kept funding Outback, I believe, during that time frame. And then when we came back in, I think they were funded at 100,000 because we thought it was televised. And then eventually we redid the, uh, the criterion and uh, put it back down to 75 and two because they're not televising the entire event nationally. So that's what they've been funding over the last several years. We should be all right with it. Okay, everybody good? Please continue. Okay, thank you. As far as the six applications, we are not recommending for funding. Uh, a new wrinkle here this year, the committee was asked to consider what a potential alternate funding source or option might look like. So one solution we discussed was to consider the non-qualifying event at a lower funding category. So I do wanna go back and look at events number nine and 15 on your scoring sheet. So St. Pete Bacon and Barbecue Festival, St. Pete Tacos and Tequila Festival, both events requested category two $75,000 in funding. When we reviewed and scored those events at those levels, they did not meet the scoring to qualify. But when we looked at them through a category three level, the value went up because it's a lower cost, so the value's going up, and we rescored it, and we would recommend it at a category three, $25,000 level. So to summarize, the committee, VSPC committee, not comfortable with the $75,000 commitment for those two events, but we are comfortable recommending $25,000 for those two events. Um, Mr. Campbell, question please. Can you tell us what time of the year those two quote unquote festivals are? <laughs> Absolutely. Give me one second. What? I think tacos and tequila just happened like recently. 
Uh, and then St. Pete Bacon and Barbecue, I think, is at the beginning of the summer. But you probably have the dates. Am I the, close? I, yeah, I've got them right here. Um, so St. Pete Bacon and Barbecue is January 13th through the 14th. And then, correct, May for Tacos and Tequila Festival. Okay. Any comments from the board? Anybody? No? Continue. So not every event that we rescored got put back into a funding recommendation. So that's where page three of your application scoring document comes into play. So six events again. So DNQ one, Halloween on Central, we initially evaluated at $75,000, did not qualify. We looked at it again as a category three and it did not qualify. I'll come back to MLK Dream Big Parade here momentarily. A DNQ three, Orange County Choppers, big bike uh, builder show, we scored it at a category three, $25,000 request, did not qualify, and then we reviewed it as a category four, $20,000 request, and it did not qualify. And then the bottom three there, um, Put the Pier, Rock and Roller Rink, Spring Festival, those are all category four requests, and since there's no tier beneath category four, we're maintaining the initial recommendation there. And then as far as MLK Dream Big Parade goes, uh, kind of considering their application and their proposed use of funds. So each of the other elite events proposing to use funds towards marketing and sponsorship, when you re review the MLK Parade application, it's towards hotel room expenses. So we did not rescore that event, but we do recommend exploring funding that event through our uh, meetings and incentive, our meetings and um, conferences incentive program. So I understand uh, Hortensia from our team, our meetings team has already reached out to uh, kind of initiate those conversations. Um, and uh, that kind of wraps up our funding recommendations. Any other questions? Questions from the board? Yes. Yes, please. <clears throat> I was looking at the uh, sand innovations and in conversations with the city of Treasure Island, um, they indicated they did not know that the, it became an either or room night or attendance. Um, they clearly scored very high at 91 with a ROI index of 232, but they didn't ask for more because they didn't think they would qualify for a category two. Is there any chance for them to come back and indicate what they would do if they were able to get to a category two? I know that was done one time last year with one of the organizations. Kind of defer to the board, Michael, if there's any you know, concerns or is that prohibited? You're allowing others to submit and um, augment their application, so I think that's fine. Okay. I'll mention it to uh, Kathy Hayduke and at the um, Park and Rec and see if they have a plan they can do more. I Just being there and being so intimate with uh, the location of it, uh, we do believe more advertisement would drive more room nights, which is the goal of the event. Thank you. Understood. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Gertis. If, if we're going to let them do that, do we need to vote to, to move the up to recommendation? Because their up to recommendation caps them, right? So I think we, if, if we want to do that, I think we'd need to move the up to recommendation. Staff laid it out for you in, a, I think, what was a simpler fashion. I think we've gone a little bit a different course. So you're right. You probably would have we to. We just did it for everybody else, though, right? Flip it. Exactly. <laughs> Unlike the staff recommendation. Right. So I think in order to make that, ha that ability happen, we have to vote to move the up to recommendation. Do you want to make a motion to that? I would like to make a motion to uh, move them up to 75000 if they reapply. Do we have a second? I'll second it. So it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. All right, moving right along, Mr. Could, Camp. Oh. Um, could I ask on the uh, Orange County Chopper bike building, Michael? Um, it's the only one that I see that 
the score stayed the same. We reviewed it a second time at a lower amount, and it did have some room nights with it in an off season. Is, is there anything we can be asking on that, or we have to take just the information that's given? Well, I'm not involved in the scoring process. That's a question for staff and the consultant. I do understand that they did apparently at some point, I think either last night or this morning, supplement some further information. I don't know if that's something that the staff is going to reevaluate um, to see whether or not that affects their scoring. Can we Mr. ask that question? Mr. Kimball, what I would say is that we received um, that, that event occurred um, after the scoring for this um, took place. And so the, the, once the event actually occurred this year, um, the actual numbers, um, now these are not numbers that we've, we've analyzed. These are numbers that were given to us last night, um, but we've been told those are the actual numbers. Those would um, exceed the minimum qualifications for the level that they um, submitted for. So you have that information at your desk um, and uh, just want to let you know, we didn't have that when we scored it. In the criteria, it says it's, you know, we judge these on their face. Given that this occurred, the event this year, first time occurred after that, you have the information that they provided. You can do with it what you wish. I'd ask, I'd recommend that we uh, uh, review that one like we did the first two and uh, take that into consideration. And uh, if it approved, then we approve the funding amount. I'll make that a motion. Is there, okay, thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Mr. Henderson. Um, if all those go forward and if they fund them all to that up to recommendation, then we're gonna be over the two million that's budgeted for this category. For elite, I believe we budgeted two million. We've always budgeted two million. We've never got close to it. Well, okay, it's 2023. Times are changing, and <laughs> I would like to ask: How many years have we had a budget of two million? Since as long as I've been here, seven years. Yes. Seven years, at least. As long as it's been in existence, the elite. I'm sorry. As long as the elite program. As the lead events program has been in existence after the Great Recession, we brought it back, and uh, it's always been two million since then. I hear you. Okay. Clearly, yeah. I hear you. That said, we all know that in the last seven years, the price for everything has skyrocketed. I venture to say it has skyrocketed for the people that are putting these events on. On top of that, we also know that our budget for Visit St. Pete Clearwater has expanded considerably over the last seven years. And so I would just like to encourage us to, maybe it's time to rethink that just a moment. And I see a couple of hands frantically waving over there. I'll get to you in just a moment. I'm not ignoring you, but um, I'm just making a case for reality here. Commissioner Biljowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we did a couple of, what is it, two months ago now, just had our budget thing. So, I mean, I certainly think Brian can take a look at it for our October, you know, and, and, and see what's necessary. I don't think we're gonna go over the budget that much. It's a budget adjustment that happens in every, every type of budget, so I don't think it's that big of a deal. And certainly relook. Now the interesting thing is, is that as you mentioned, Phil, we have never gone over that two million. And we gave direction this last year, spend the money. Stop not spend, I mean, there was one year we only had a million too. It's like, no, we want that money out there because it only helps um, the culture and the environment of, of, of offering something for people to visit. So. You know, certainly take a look for our October budget that we've already reviewed and see if we need to up it. But I'm not worried about this year's budget because it's only going to be a hundred or two hundred thousand, and with the size budget we have, is so big, it's not going to make that much of a difference. And we'll 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 find that money. We'll be able to accommodate it. However, it will come out of 
you know, a, a, another area's budget, and that could be marketing and advertising. So we'll, well find it. You've but. got reserves. Uh, hold on. I, I can, you see this chart? You haven't seen it yet. I can make a strong case about that comment you just made, too. And trust me, I'm going to share it before this meeting is over today. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Mr. Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, um, I agree with what's being said here. Um, is it appropriate to make a, a motion for Brian, the committee, to engage in a review to see what should we raise this to rather than we pick an arbitrary number of 2.5, 3 million, whatever? Can, can we have the um, Jim, Abernathy, Jim Abernathy and his team come back with a recommendation? Perfect. Is that a motion? That's a motion. Do we need a second? Second that. Do we have a second? second? Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Everyone in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Done. Please go forward and you'll do your thing. And, um, okay, I'm going to reserve my comment till later, but go ahead. I'd like to make a comment, though, is that we have met our $2 million number but I'd also encourage that staff uh, does an uh, effort for next year, for 25, to look at the, the diversity of the county and try and see areas that we haven't done any uh, promotions with that we maybe could do something where times have changed. Oldsmar, Safety Harbor, Tarpon Springs, Palm, uh, up in those areas, and there's some other areas I can see that we ought to make a better effort if we're going to increase the budget. Don't worry. Thank you. Okay. Uh, before we move on, Mr. Campbell, I think we owe it to our citizens who have been waiting patiently for an opportunity to share their thoughts. And I would like to ask um, Mr. Chavez to please come up. And then... Thank you. Um, yeah, everything has gone up. And uh, the, uh, the race that, that we put on, it costs three times more to put it on with the price of insurance, the price of helicopters, uh, safety boats, uh, taking care of the cities and whatnot. So, I mean, and I mean, you know, I hate saying this, but, you know, $2 million for what, how you get this community involved is, is nothing for how much money is raised through that hotel money. So I want to thank all you hoteliers, by the way, too. Keep it up. And we have a thousand, a thousand more hotel rooms just coming on Clearwater Beach. So I think, I think that that budget needs to be raised a little bit. Okay? And uh, thank you for everything you all do. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Overton, please come forward. There must be something really important going on for all these new people to show up today. Welcome. Nice Janet, to you. when you're the chair, we all come. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. It's all about me. It's all about you. Uh -huh. uh, I'm Keith Overton. I own OCC Roadhouse and Museum. I actually <clears throat> am the applicant for two events here. I'd like to address them both quickly, but I'll do them one at a time. The, uh, the show that Russ Kimball mentioned, the Orange County Choppers Invitational Bike Show, um, there's some timing in this that you should understand. The, the show actually occurred at the very first weekend of May. The application deadline was originally supposed to be submitted by, by May 1st, which would have given us the data that we needed to submit because other than attendance, we would have had all of the hotel rooms booked and so forth at that time. Um, the application deadline got moved up to May or March 31st, and we were like, oh, we're not going to have that information available, so we'll go ahead and you know, submit a conservative estimate and then hopefully come back to the council with the actual numbers. So we've done that. <clears throat> I believe the actual numbers, you know, without doubt, get the score. We only missed it by six points. It gets it up from a 64 well over to a 70. 
Um, and so I think if that could be a consideration, that would be greatly appreciated. I've provided the data points in here for the review committee to look at. The second thing I would say is this. <clears throat> I would just recommend, having served on this board and been a part of this process for many years, what I didn't know was that if you as a private enterprise that wants to promote an event and come before this committee want to use the preferred vendor, which is uh, destination analyst, to do a study for you, because of course once you receive the money, that study is done on your behalf to justify that the event supports the funding. But if you as a private business owner want to go to them to do that, I got a quote of $17,000 to do this study. I mean, the event, I'm only asking for 25000 <laughs> So I said, well, can we massage it? Is there anything we can do? And the answer to me was, no, it's $17,000. Now, I know the board here does not pay $17,000 to support a study done for every single one of the 40 events that they approve money for. So I think my suggestion would be that if you're going to use them as a partner, they are to have a fixed preferred industry rate that they can offer to the business owner. If you want more applicants to come forward with great events and you want studies to be done on them to support the fact that they're quality events, you, you can't price gouge the, the, the sponsor, you know, the event promoter, and charge them $17,000 for the study. That's crazy. That ought to be contracted with, with destination analysts, and it ought to be something that they provide a, you know, no more than five or six thousand dollars or some number that's more reasonable but seventeen thousand was just sticker shock to me the last point that i would like to make <clears throat> the second event and i'm not here to talk about that but it does relate to frank chevis event the offshore racing uh, event that's going to occur here um, <clears throat> i think we need to redefine national television when it comes to the category one um, national television isn't what it used to be. I mean, if you get a million viewers on national television today, it's been a success. But there are a lot of streaming platforms out there, and I'll give you one as an example. The last powerboat race I was at in Sarasota did it on Facebook Live. Um, if you've got a million followers on Facebook Live, and you're doing a two-hour show, um, or maybe it's intervals of an hour over a course of a day, and it might even be a six-hour show, the viewership value is much greater than it is paying to be on a network platform. So I, I think to define national television uh, is very important because it's not the same today as it was when the policy was written and for the criteria. And I, and I do believe that if you can demonstrate that you have enough views that are, that are watching on whatever platform it is, whether it's Facebook Live or, or whether it's another, you know, there's a hundred of them out there. I think that would be a much better and more fair, because I have an event that, that qualifies for that. We're on a streaming platform, but because we're not considered to be national television, we did not get to 150000 for St. Pete Bike Fest. Um, and we've been doing that event for many years, and it gets far more television than it would, you know, a TV show that's stuck on at 10 o'clock at night on Fox Sports 1. No offense to Fox Sports 1. But, um, so I think you ought to really revisit those rules and rewrite that to, to accommodate the social side of things now. And, the, and put, a, put a threshold on there for whatever views you want it to be and, and look at it that way. So thank you for your time. Appreciate you allowing me to speak. And thank you very much for your uh, suggestions that might potentially bring us into the 21st, 22nd century. Well, I, I, there's nothing wrong with the way you're doing it. I just think it's, it needs to be revisited because it's just outdated, the methodology. That's all. Good. Uh, Mayor? It's just one other question I have is, it's been mentioned it has to be live TV. Because I know in the past I thought we did a triathlon and that was always tape delayed. Because some events you really can't broadcast live because of the nature of them. And it's actually better if it's tape delayed and they put the beauty shots at the beach and the hotels in and all that good stuff than just live TV. So I'd just like to get a clarification on that. Too. If I may, the current guidelines, just to um, address Mr. Overton's concerns, do contemplate other streaming services. So we've already taken that into account. It's not national television is not the only requirement. It's national television or streaming services, such as the ones listed today. I think where we're losing the emphasis is what is broadcast? Is it a 30 second clip on some streaming service or is it they're showing a substantive piece of the event? That's the difference. I think the emphasis has been placed on the wrong thing. So I think that's what this committee then the TD, uh, and the BCC needs to consider when they're deciding whether something meets broadcast or not. It's not just little snippets. It's are they transmitting the event. Understood, and that's important. But what about 
tape delay as opposed to live TV. That would be fine. That would be fine if it, if it meets the viewership and it meets the goal of they're actually tele, uh, they're actually streaming or televising or what have you the event itself. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We good. Anyone else? No. Okay. Um, I'm so sorry. Did I miss an, uh, Stacy? Did I miss another person from the public that wanted to speak, Mr. Gao? I apologize very much. Please forgive me. Thank you, gentlemen. And certainly, Chair, you are forgiven. Um, Thank you. Yeah, just real quickly. My name is Jeff Gao, uh, 1140 Mary Jane Lane, Dunedin. I'm a Dunedin City Commissioner. And in that position, I represent the Scottish culture and heritage in Dunedin. And so I'm here speaking this morning on behalf of the Dunedin Scottish Arts Foundation. President Eric McNeil could not be here this morning. He is actually teaching Scottish drumming out of the country. So that is, that is the breadth of, of Dunedin's reach and what we do in our Scottish heritage. Actually, I'm just here to, to thank you all for supporting our Highland Games and supporting Dunedin's Scottish culture, heritage, our performing arts. And that's it. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. All right. Are we good, Brian? We need to approve the rest of the list, the recommendations. We didn't, haven't done that yet. Oh, we didn't do that? Okay. No. So do you so want to make a we, I move that we approve all the other items on the list as recommended by our staff. Do we have a second? Second. All right. All those in favor, please designate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the recommendations are approved. Thank you, Mr. Campbell, for all your hard work. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, one Ryan more item. Says we have one more item. Yeah, one quick item here. Just wanted to give a, a shout out. Um, you met some of the new full time staff here this morning. Uh, I'm equally excited to uh, introduce you to our two summer interns. Just two uh, total rock stars. Uh, they started in mid to late May for us. They're in their final couple weeks uh, here at VSPC. But I did want to thank them for their help with all the elite event materials today and actually invite them to come up and share a little bit about their experience this summer. So if I could ask Sophia Sanders and Kaylin Strouch uh, to come on up and they're going to share all about their um, summer with us. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Kaylin Strouch, and I'm currently a university student. At Could you USF. please speak into the mic so we don't miss anything that you yes, say? Yes, ma'am. Um, so I'm currently a master's student at the University of Southern Florida, studying global tourism and sustainable tourism. Um, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you, um, everyone, for letting us be here, and thank you, Mr. Campbell, for um, shouting us out. My name is Sophia Sanders. I'm an upcoming senior at Northern Arizona University, and I'm studying uh, business management. So we're just going to give you a little overview of what we've learned so far during our internship and the opportunities we've had, just like this one, to sit in on these cool meetings that I didn't even know were happening within our community. Um, we've gotten the chance to work under the Film Commission and learn how permitting works with the filming industry here and the jurisdictions that come into play and also how we communicate, communicate between different organizations and departments. We've also had the opportunity to work under LATAM and learn how to utilize our destination's assets to market towards international communities, which has actually been very interesting and rewarding as well. And we've gotten the ability to work with one of their FAM itineraries and meet their clients as well to have more of a hands-on experience. We've also worked with the community and brand engagement um, department. Uh, I also, we got the opportunity to work at um, several different events. Um, we just spearheaded the event, uh, the I Tampa Bay Ice Cream Festival, um, which was an amazing experience. Um, I also got to attend both the um, St. Pete Pride Parade, where I got to meet um, Madam Chair and Commissioner Justice. Um, and also work on the um, St. Pete Pride Festival. Um, we've also worked with the sports department. Um, I got the opportunity, as well as Kaylin, to learn more about their department. We attended an event and um, also um, helped with different um, 
sports venues and learning all about their department. Yeah, so we're just really grateful for the opportunity to be here and learn from you guys as well as the amazing staff at VSBC. They work so incredibly hard and are so passionate about what they do that it's been very rewarding to see that so much work goes into such a great organization. So thank you for having us. You're very welcome. I'm glad to meet you today and have the opportunity to be able to expose you to some of the fabulous things that are going on in this county. And maybe one day you'll come back and actually work at Visit St. Pete Clearwater. Wouldn't that be terrific? That's the dream. <laughs> there you go. Okay, Brian, future applicant for you to consider. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you guys. Good luck, girls. Thank you for being here. Okay. Commissioner. Yes. One, two final thoughts on the elite events. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, two million, we've never reached it, not because of cost increase or anything else. We've never had this many applicants. And I think it's great we have that many. And by the time they get done negotiating, they're not going to hit the two million probably anyway. So it's not a, not a concern this year. Um, future years, maybe, because it looks like it's growing words out. And you know, we can help some other, um, other festivals and so forth to get off the ground. Secondly, I'd like to thank those that did all the reviews. For anybody who sat on this committee reviewing eight to 10 asks, thank goodness I didn't have to read 33. So thank you all very much on staff for, for doing that for us and presenting this. It was a great job. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. All right, are we, okay, we're all good. So uh, without further ado, let's move to the department reports. Brian? Thanks, Craig. You really made him look good. <laughs> so I'm going to go through um, quickly. Uh, you have the destination metrics numbers in front of you. Um, uh, I will go quickly through these um, just to highlight a few things. And uh, I'm joined today with Eddie. Um, he's our data guru. Um, so at the end, if you'd like to, if you've got any Anywhere you'd like to dig in further, have any questions, um, Eddie's got my back. So starting off with the TDT collections, since we met in May, uh, or excuse, in May, we've got April and May, so those are both gonna be um, included on here. You will notice um, that both April and May were down. April was down uh, $800,000, and May was down $200,000. As far as collections by municipality, um, highlighting that uh, Palm Harbor and the Bel Airs in April were down, saw the steepest decrease, and uh, miscellaneous others, as well as St. Petersburg, saw the largest increases. Moving over to May, Bel Airs continued to be in the largest decrease. Uh, Madeira Beach, you'll see, had actually the largest decrease in May. Um, again, uh, Palm Harbor must have had a, an event uh, at, at the um, premier property up there in May. Those numbers uh, where they were down in the first in April in 20, they were uh, leading the pack in, in their year-over-year in -year increase. And then St. Petersburg continued um, to be 8.9% 8 up in May. Destination metrics for lodging in April. Um, occupancy rate for hotels uh, down 1%, uh, vacation rentals down 6.6%, average daily rate in the hotels down $3.64, and daily rate in vacation rentals down $10. As far as by area, occupancy on the beach down 2.6%, inland up 0.3%, average daily rate for the beach down $12.52, and on inland, again, you'll see that increased uh, $4.62. Moving to May, um, similar trend that you're seeing here, occupancy in hotels down 1.1%, um, vacation rentals down 6.6%, daily rate in the hotels down $6.24, and daily rate in vacation rentals down $10. As far as by area, Beach down 2.2%, 2 
inland only going down a half a percent, the beach rate down $14.30, and inland up eight cents. So this here, um, this graph here shows uh, that occupancy rate, and you'll see that um, uh, from 2022, um, the, uh, excuse me, since the pandemic, these are the first two months now that we've seen that trend of where we are um, down over 2022. Again, here we are uh, on a average daily rate uh, on a graph, same trend. And moving over to vacation rentals, uh, ADR down 4%. Adjusted paid and owner occupancy down 8%, adjusted rev par down 13%, and average length this day actually went up 6%. Moving to May, ADR 4% uh, increase, adjusted paid and owner occupancy down 14%, adjusted rev par down 13%, average length this day remain unchanged. And then this is forward looking July through September, ADR 4%, uh, adjusted paid and owner occupancy down 8%, adjusted rev par um, only down 1% and average length of, of stay up 3%. And then looking at the April visitor profile again, uh, as a reminder, this is a snapshot in time uh, based on a survey um, that we conduct. Um, few things I wanted to point out, you'll notice the daily spend is down $33. Um, average time, decision to travel, uh, folks are, are putting more time, they're thinking about it more, um, and um, uh, they're, they're really doing their research uh, before they do travel. So you see that shrink from 71 days down to 57 days. And then the average income, this one jumped off the page at me, um, I don't know yet. Uh, if this, you know, where as long as I've been uh, watching these meetings, I've seen that around $100, or, or excuse me, $100,000, um, and uh, seeing that at $77,000, uh, we will know once we see the May uh, visitor profile, uh, we'll be able to tell, was this just, uh, you know, a blimp in the radar, or do we start to see a trend? Those are the metrics I have for you. I'm happy to answer any questions to the best of my ability. If not, uh, Eddie's going to Take the mic. Brian, do we know what the sample size is of these matrix? Eddie, please. So generally speaking, the sample size is um, at minimum over 300. Typically, we get around 400 or so uh, intercept surveys each month. Um, so annually, we have about 5,200 uh, intercept surveys or, or about that number to, you know, work from. Thank you. Following, if I might, Commissioner, that, Commissioner Moore. Sorry, that question about sample size, that three to 400 number, is that including, you know, the hotels the, the, and the vacation rentals? So that number is intercept surveys taken from different. Oh, I'm sorry, intercept from the from the visitors. Okay, mm -hmm. apologize. Commissioner yep. Henderson. Um, all the data up to this to this last one was all about hotel stays and overnight visitors. This is something I've asked for on several occasions to split out overnight versus day trippers, um, because you you now you see a mean stay of 3.3. Uh, versus 3.1, well, that's because you're averaging people that didn't spend the night. Only 31% of this group spent stayed overnight. <clears throat> so, again, I would like to see these metrics broken out on a visitor profile of those who stay overnight and those who do not. Um, you've got, you know, 69% of the people didn't stay overnight. So what's the average income? You know, what, what are we looking for to attract people to come to stay in hotels and vacation rentals to come stay here for a few, you know, for, for six nights, not for three, and be able to see the profile of that person versus the profile of the day tripper. So I think we do generally provide more of that breakout data on a quarterly basis instead of on the monthly basis due to concerns about sampling size and that being, you know, can fluctuate from month to month. 
Uh, however, I'll uh, get with destination analysts to provide a, a better breakout of, of those. Well, I'd just like to see the numbers. You know, you, you sampled 300, 400, whatever. 31% of those did not stay overnight, okay? So give me stats on the 31 that didn't stay overnight and give me stats on the 69%, I'm sorry, the 69% the that didn't stay overnight and the 31% that did stay overnight. What was their average stay? The average night stayed for the didn't stay overnight is zero, <laughs> okay? Not 3.3, you know? I've got to do some serious math to figure out, well, it's a lot higher than that, but how much higher? You, you understand what I'm asking for? Right, so you're asking that number relative to only the people who stayed overnight versus combining. Let's look at the visitor profile of those who don't spend the night and those who do stay at night. Okay. It's two different groups. So we can see true data on people that come here and stay in accommodations and then the other data who, who just visit for the daytime to come to the Florida Marine Aquarium from Tampa, something like that. Okay. You know, that's, a, that's a different kind of visitor than an overnight stay. I think it's really important to segment those. You know, ask so, for it <laughs> over and over and over, and it doesn't seem to hit home. So, Commissioner Henderson, uh, rather than grilling the staff person sitting, standing there in the hut, uh, hut seat, uh, maybe we could just take a pause and recognize that there are some significant data points to glean out of the numbers we're getting today, and I think you'll see going forward a lot of changes taking place, not in, only in reporting, but how we look at the data that we're getting and what is really missing. And you know what? To give st staff the direction to do those things requires real solid leadership, which we all know this organization has not had for a long time. With that said, uh, Ms. Mr. Gertis, Uh, I'm loud enough, I normally don't need the microphone. Um, I think I brought it up in May, and again, I know a lot has happened since May, but I, I brought up when we're looking at occupancy, also looking at inventory and inventory of what's being reported. So if we had a thousand more rooms report compared to 22, that would skew that percentage number depending on occupancy. And so I think some of those, and I don't know that we need to do that monthly, but I, it, for me, it would be helpful to see, because I think about everything that's being built right on Clearwater and St. Pete and all, ac across our county, everything that's being built. We also want to look at inventory compared to occupancy, because as we continue to grow, you know, those are going to be the, these. Like when I look at, yes, it's down. It's two percent. Yes, we don't want it to go down. But that could certainly be within the mean of, it, of, of an inventory swing. And so I, I just want to make sure we're looking at that, too, and not making decisions based on a 2% decline, right? Like, I don't. So yeah, we, we are looking at a variety of, of different things, including the, the total demand and supply of the destination. We also look at um, different destinations in the state of Florida and see how we're doing compared to that. You know, I can share, um, we receive the report and we receive how uh, basically generally that, that state of Florida is doing. And generally we're above um, the, the state of Florida. You know, it, it's, it's difficult to look at the data and then try to come up with, with your story because we see a lot of different points. We also look at um, information just from a, from a domestic standpoint, from a regional standpoint, from any sort of different data source that we're able to, to look at. Um, and you know, there's, there's different indications there that kind of give us a little bit of that picture. Uh, it's, it's a little bit early to really kind of come up with the storyline for, for what we're seeing in the data. Um, but I can share, you know, generally speaking, we're looking at um, uh, beach destination data and, and we're seeing that Across the board, you know, beach destination travel is is a little bit down. Uh, travel to urban centers is up. Um, we're seeing, you know, just just some different trends like that. So it's it's a it again it's it's too early to kind of write the story for for what's going on and then what's going on with us specifically. Um, but there is a, a you know 
variety of factors that, that we're, we're looking at. Obviously, the supply and demand is, is a big part of it. As we know, we have new uh, hotel inventory that's opened up, both on the beach and in inland. So we look at that dynamic and see where those biggest losses are coming from as well. Um, so there's there's just a, you know a, a lot of data to, yeah. to, to kind of sift through. Yeah, I appreciate that context, Eddie. And also, and again, I, I want to make it very clear. I don't I don't think we need to do that deep dive every month, right? But maybe like semi-annually, just check in on like where inventory is at and what that trend might look like. We do it almost. I'm every sure. Week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We. <right> here. <laughs> but no, I appreciate it. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you. Thank you, oh, Commissioner Bilzowski. I, I was just going to say, that, I mean, not that this makes a difference, but. I'm hearing from my short-term rental people in Dunedin, the ones that have regular ones or have several that are well-known in our community, that they're, they're really struggling to fill. And some of them are thinking about converting to long-term rental. Um, and as you know, through COVID, a lot of that, there were a lot of people that sort of increased to that model to do the short-term. So I just think that's important to know as you're looking at all of this, and especially if you're if you are comparing the number of units of hotel rooms, and you know but, I don't know if Doreen's hearing the same thing with her business, but that's what I'm hearing in Dunedin. Commissioner Moore. So thank you. Uh, following that lead-in, I was going to, and my one-on-one -on -one coming up with Brian, um, I was going to talk with you about drilling down on our vacation rental partners, we'd had discussions about the key data and them having more vacation rental partners so that that data about vacation rentals has a broader reach. So the, the stats that you all get, and so I think that's important. We can discuss that in more detail. Um, and I'm gonna go back based on looking, you know, at our, our numbers and, and your conversation. Personally, as a, as a vacation rental company, um, we're still having a very strong market. And I want to take and compare our numbers to the ADRs and our occupancies and some of those other numbers just to kind of get a feel on how that compares overall. Um, so I wrote myself a note to, to do that internally. Um, but I'm not seeing that as a downward trend. Um, possibly pricing, because we know for even from the hotel industry that uh, you know maybe prices that, that price increase does need to be adjusted a little bit. But we'll we'll work on that. Uh, Clyde, I don't know if you've got any comments from your your uh, hybrid of hotel and vacation. Just the one comment that I had, and I think we did used to get, or maybe it's a quarterly thing, Eddie, uh, the star report information, because there you're looking at revenue per available room, and that takes into account whatever the inventory is. It's just how many, doesn't matter how many rooms, it's how much revenue are they generating per that. I think that's, that's a stat we use every week in my business. Yeah, so we uh, have been really, since DD has been on board, doing outreach to every data partner we have, making sure that we're receiving the full reports. Um, the SDR forecast report is one that um, we, uh, you know, ha had followed up on and, and will be receiving directly now. Uh, with regard to the short-term vacation rental market, you know, it, it, it is quite an interesting situation. Again, I wish I had, you know, the, the storyline to say what's going on, but it does look like, uh, to, to your point, Mayor, there's... Uh, maybe a little bit more volatility within that market. There's different economic factors, possibly. Um, you look at, you know, the, the housing market and how that can correlate to the short-term rental market. Um, we've looked at key data's, um, you know, how, how everything is doing domestically and, and regionally. The, the southeast of the United States for the month of April was down about 10%. So kind of indicates, you know, it's it's not just our destination. It's, it's a broader area. Um, and certainly, I reached out to Key Data uh, prior to this meeting to really get a better estimate of how much of our available vacation rental market is on that platform. Unfortunately, I hadn't heard back from them prior to this meeting. Um, but I, I hope to, you know, continue to work towards getting more partners on board with that. Excuse me, um, Brian. Yeah, I would just say, um, right in line to many of the questions that have come up. 
Um, I, I do want to highlight that um, Eddie did um, get, add Didi to the team, uh, what, two and a half, three weeks ago now. Um, and that's what she does. She's, she's in the data. She's digging in there. She's analyzing it. Uh, and in addition to that, Eddie and his team uh, have found um, some software um, and some platforms uh, that is going to be uh, that are superior to the ones that are using now, um, and so uh, they are moving forward with uh, uh, purchasing those. And so between the upgraded software and the additional staff, um, we're really going to get wild with the data. Good, good to know. Now, Eddie, when you come back to talk to us next month, would you be so kind as to include a short snippet? of the data from Visit Tampa, because I'm very interested, given the research that myself and Tony have been doing, on the fact that they have a very much smaller, <coughs> excuse me, budget than we do, and how even though their numbers, I think, will surprise all of us, and I think that would be instructive in terms of a, another conversation I'd like to have hopefully in August. Yeah, and I can even share, you know, we've been looking at Hillsboro, Orlando, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, just to see what their numbers were doing in, in April and May. Um, for Hillsboro, we actually saw them uh, lose more occupancy than us. However, their ADR went up quite a bit. Um, my first speculation was from a Taylor Swift concert uh, that, that, that happened about that period. Um, however, we've also seen um, a, a trend with specifically Hillsboro and Orlando where their occupancy is actually lower um, and c continues to kind of decrease. However, their ADR um, is, is continuing to increase. So their RevPAR, you know, is, is benefiting from that higher ADR amount um, for those past two months. I was actually just looking at June and, you know, the trend is kind of continuing for those metropolitan areas, which might indicate, you know, I'm, I'm not saying it is, might indicate, you know, that, that increased interest into that urban visitation. However, you know, that's, that's purely speculation, um, but it's, we're definitely taking a very close look. Each month we see, you know, any sort of comparative report with how we're doing with our other Florida destinations. Okay, anything else, Brian, for the moment? Commissioner Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Kofi, I, I agree with your, your comments on understanding inventory. Taking that a step further, we all hear anecdotally about new hotel projects coming into the county. Um, it would be really interesting on a forward-looking basis to say, here's what's coming. Here's what's in the development pipeline um, that Marriott's building a new blah, blah, blah. Hilton's adding a new blah, blah, blah. Um, periodically, it would be great to see what that development pipeline looks like um, for the entire county, to know what's coming. You think we could put something like that together? We'll certainly commit to trying. Great. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Henderson. My apologies if I uh, was grilling you on that. I'm just trying to drive a point that uh, that I've asked for for several months and actually years. Um, but along with that thought, when you bring back the Tampa data, if you could separate it, because it's a, I was, <laughs> I read the data back in the 90s and I moved a boat to Tampa thinking they had all this tourism. It turns out it was mostly day trippers. So it's interesting to see those numbers separated. So, uh, Mr. Henderson, I do want to share on our visitor profile for the annual year, we take a look at, um, overnight visitors, uh, visiting family, friends, and relatives, and day trippers, and have the data split between all those different things. So we do know that, for example, uh, the daily spend for an overnight visitor is closer to $300, whereas it's much lower for the day tripper. So, so we do break out that data um, just on the monthly basis. We, you know, there's concerns about kind of the, the sampling size for that. Um, but I, I can see what information we can get broken out on on a month to month basis with right. with destinations. Just saying, when you if we're going to compare what Tampa is doing, it'd, it'd be nice to see not just aggregate but overnight versus day trippers to Hillsborough County. Yeah, because I think that it's a drastic different situation there. 
Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Um, Brian, do you have anything else to reflect on the destination metrics? No? All right. Oh, well, now we are at that point in the meeting where we have board member comments and discussion. So who wants to lead that? Commissioner Moore. Thank you. Um, as your representative on Creative Pinellas, uh, an ex officio member of Creative Pinellas Board, um, and having served in various board capacities with Creative Pinellas since its inception, I just wanted to bring everyone up to date that, um, as you all are, I'm sure, aware that our uh, chair, Barbara St. Clair, will be retiring. And we have uh, been in the search process, uh, number one, for a search company to uh, then get, bring us candidates for that position, working closely with VSPC, of course. And uh, the search committee uh, reviewed eight proposals uh, from search companies, search firms. And uh, last week we did select and have negotiated with um, Arts, Culture, Arts and Culture Group, ACG, and uh, they will be moving forward rapidly and bringing us through their proposal to bring candidates. Then we have a separate search committee made up to be interviewing um, those candidates through that process. And, of course, VSPC has been integral with, with uh, us as well. So uh, this company does uh, specialize in placing arts administrators, and we're very, very pleased uh, to have this team behind us to, to make um, what we expect to be a very qualified uh, decision and choice in, in leading us forward. And of course, um, there will be plenty of opportunity as we go through this towards the end of the year um, for a January 1 uh, posting to thank Barbara for all of her contributions. And it's, it's been a pleasure knowing her and having her on board. And, and obviously, her role continues to be um, really, really uh, supportive to get the right person. So thank you for that opportunity. Excellent. Next, who's next? Commissioner Williams and then Commissioner Henderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just uh, looking at the budget um, and on the second page, there's an expenditure for beach uh, nourishment uh, that um, we've spent just over $7 million October through June. I know that the beach renourishing is a huge issue and question that is still in, in debate, but help me understand what has that seven million dollars gone to what what have we done with that well i can't speak a hundred percent on that i i believe and maybe mr henderson has the answer before i say what i'm going to say it goes, it goes into the nourishment fund so that's just it goes funding. directly into yeah. the fund and then it's pulled out as it's needed but it's allocated as it's needed which was going to be my question do we have an update on where we stand with the core and many possible solutions for San Key. Yeah, so the update with the core is uh, we they're, they're, they've still taken their position um, and the uh, staff um, did a presentation to the Board of County Commissioners last week to bring them up to speed uh, on where we stand as well as provide some different scenarios uh, that OMB and Kelly work with to forecast out how much uh, the, the impact that those different scenarios would have on the tourist development um, tax, as well as the, uh, specifically uh, the, the half, half cent. Um, and so there were a number of different scenarios there, um, ranging from we're in great shape to we're not in great shape whatsoever. Um, so a lot of those remain unanswered until we have some, some decisions made from the core, but we're continuing to engage with the, uh, starting to engage with the other counties who are now in the same boat that we are. Um, before it was just us on our own. This was a Pinellas problem. Now it's a state of Florida problem. It's a state of South Carolina problem. It's a state of New Jersey, New York problem. Uh, so we're really ramping up there. I don't know, uh, there, we can't give you an answer today, but uh, there's gonna be a heavy emphasis on 
uh, continuing to forecast out different scenarios and the impacts that that and any, every project uh, coming out of that fund from the tourist development tax, um, what those would look like. And so once we have that, uh, we'll have some better information for you. It was, it was suggested to me that if it was possible to, to reword the, the ask for the easement to be just for the Corps of Army Engineers, Army Corps of Engineers to do the work, not have a public easement. I don't know how that works legally or within the statutes or whatever, but somebody had suggested that to me that maybe they could change the way it's written so that it only allows the Corps of Engineers to come on their property, not to have general public throw it out there for, you know. I'll tell you, I know I've been, thought. just in the time that I've, uh, wearing my other hat, been engaged in that, in that process for five years, Kelly's been doing it longer. The number one thing that we were asking for was change to the verbiage uh, within that e the, within the easement, um, it's it's a scary document to some people when they see that. Um, so man. we've been asking. They budged a couple years ago on on uh, made some small movement on the language, uh, but since that it's been a hard line in the sand uh, that they're not changing that yeah, that well language. They, they think if they can use public funds to to improve the beaches, it should be public beach, or they should have that easement, I guess. But. Uh. Um, I would just I would just like to share that myself and Tony have been working on a project which I plan to share a little bit with Kevin right after this meeting and if if uh, it works we think we might have identified a way to find new revenues that will help the county do beach renourishment I'm not going to go so far as to say on our own, but substantially be able to take care of our beaches in a more cost-effective manner than we have been doing. And I would also like to share that at the Resiliency and Sustainability Conference that was held this year out on Clearwater Beach at the Hilton uh, on Clearwater Beach, there was a world-renowned geologist who gave a presentation to us who spoke about this problem that we're having now in Florida about the coastline is the same problem that he is seeing happening all around the coast of the eastern United States. And that this, if we think that this is an issue that is going to be taken care of in the next 15, 20 years, we are operating with our head in the sand because this is the natural move, ebb, and flow of the tides that actually has been going on for centuries. So with that said, I do think that we have to begin thinking in a different way about almost the way we do everything that involves our beaches and I'm excited actually to present the new idea to all of you and hope that you will come to the meeting in August <laughs> fully satisf satisfied with a nice breakfast and a big open mind to what's going on in the real world going forward. Isn't that interesting? I think it's fascinating. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, Commissioner Kimball, did you have additional? Mr. Williams, did you have additional? Phil? Copley? Anyone over? Yes. Yes, please. And Just, then Mayor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Wonder where we're at with the budget approval, because we did not make any motion uh, when we went through the whole budget book. Um, we had the little twist at the end. And just where we're at with that to the Board of County Commissioners. Yeah, and that's actually one of my last two notes here uh, under my report. So I'll just give you a quick update on the budget. Um, yesterday at the BCC meeting, the county administrator did uh, present his proposed uh, budget to the Board of County Commissioners, um, and they will be working on that and meeting through work sessions and one-on-ones um, throughout the next two months um, before uh, they have the budget hearings in September for the 2024 budget. Um, what I can tell you uh, from the proposed budget in the, in the administrator's recommended budget um, for the CVB, 
Um, it has a slight increase uh, uh, up to $53.1 million. Essentially the same, we, we started off the, the same budget from last year um, with some, some small increases due to salaries, staffing costs, uh, cost of doing business. Um, the marketing uh, uh, is, is the same uh, there in that year. What we had was uh, 12 decision packages, and I don't recall if these were um, laid out in the May budget presentation that you all had, um, but uh, essentially all the spending, all the, uh, all the requests for spending above last year's budget, those were um, broken down into funding, uh, into decision package, individual decision packages. We had 12 of them from this department. Um, each of those were reviewed, and in the recommended um, 2024 budget, um, there are uh, seven of those um, that are included, just so you know, um, because this is hot off the press. Um, there were the additional funding for capital funding program consultant for $100,000 one time. Uh, that was included. Increased funding for Chambers of Commerce support. There's $100,000 recurring. The uh, countywide cultural plan continuation uh, one time, moving that $200,000 for the cultural plan into 24, that's included. The increase uh, in the annual contribution of the Creative Pinellas operating expenses from TDT funds, 70, uh, an additional $75,000, that's included, that's recurring. And the increase in the public relations and marketing services contract in the UK and Germany, um, that increase of $7,500 is included. Uh, an increase to the CVB travel um, for higher, higher travel costs and need to attend trade shows and conferences. That's been included at $126,000 additional, and then uh, an, an additional $11,000 for CVB training and education. Uh, the decision packages that weren't included on there, um, I won't go through all those, um, but the two big ones that, that I'll tell you we're working on are the marketing uh, for both traditional and digital combined. Those equaled, I believe it was $8 million in, in increased uh, funding for those. Um, what we are in the process of doing is looking through that data, getting the data that we need that, that shows um, and, uh, why are we marketing in the markets that we are, how we're doing it, uh, where do we want to go if we were to receive that increased funding, and what do we expect from that if we were to do that? So we want to take that data, paint that story of what we want to do, uh, and then we'll go to um, county administration to make that request. But we've got to have that information um, to be able to serve him uh, before we go and make that request. Very good. Leon? Just to finish in what uh, Mike said earlier, Coachman Park was a huge success, the sound, the opening. I saw some of you there, and uh, it, unfortunately, <laughs> I planned a 16-day vacation back in December before I knew I was ever going to be appointed mayor again, so I only <laughs> was there for the grand opening. Thank God I was there for the grand opening, but uh, nothing but positive comments. Uh, we are tying it, we're promoting it as tying the beach to the park, the waterway to the park. We just extended the ferry uh, for 10 more years, and we're promoting people coming over on the ferry. And so I think it's going to be a great marketing tool for this agency. Uh, and if you haven't been out there, it's fabulous. Go out there and check it out. There's a lot of great concerts coming up. Uh, I know it's a little warm right now, but hopefully we get to September and the other, <laughs> when the concert season really starts, it'll start cooling off a little bit in the evenings. But it's, it's been great. And uh, Mike's or anything you want to add? I know you were there, and I think you had a good time. Bill, did you have additional comments? No? Anybody else over here? No? Yep. Uh, Brian, thank you. Um, uh, yes, I, I thought the grand opening event, the ribbon cutting, was a great success. Well attended. Um, it, it, wonderful park. Is it, is it managed by Ruth Eckert Entertainment? The sound is, but the parks, the parks were managed by the city of Clearwater. But the, this, this Ruth Eckert Hall will be programming a minimum of right. 35 events a year, a minimum. And then the city has events they can also stage there, which was the 4th of July was the city's event. And got great reviews on that. I had a citizen from Tampa write me a long email about how wonderful it was for him and his family. They're going to come back every year, how well it was just logistically planned, and just how patriotic the show was. It was, it was really nice. Yeah, it was great. Well. 
I was there the entire weekend going to all the shows and uh, they were all very well attended and everything came off perfectly. Amazing for a brand new venue to be opened up and not have any real issues that were visible to the public. There may have been some behind the scenes issues, but uh, but all in all, it was uh, very well orchestrated and very well received and very well attended across the board. And we're looking forward to, to being there over the years more and more. Thanks. Excellent. All right. Well, it appears that we have reached the end of our agenda, so if there's nothing else for the good of the order, we are adjourned. <laughs>